which has recorded its first case. This very one is coming from the Okonfanochi Teaching Hospital. The moment it gets here, even before it gets to the main laboratory, it has to be disinfected just to ensure that there isn't any contamination. So that is a process that this particular box currently is going through. Uh, everything is done meticulously. Samples are sent to the Biosafety Level 3 laboratory to begin the process of testing. The staff work round the clock under a shift system to meet timelines. The use of polymerase chain reaction PCR method means a sample can last between two and six hours for real-time results to be produced. The PCR is two to six hours and with the increasing numbers you can see that we are now taking over 48 hours to release results which is not uh, the best. Uh, actually if you look at the WHO protocol the PCR is supposed to be used for active case detection. For people who are symptomatic they have disease and they go to the hospital then you can do them for PCR because you want to determine the active viral circulation but the antibody based test helps a lot in understanding the true burden of the disease and how far the disease is, is moving through the population the obvious reason for continuous backlog but has Ghana reached its peak as claimed by the director general of health service the best of my understanding, if you have reached your peak, it means that majority of your populations have been infected by the virus and therefore the level of infection or transmissibility is beginning to go down so you can, re you can relax measures and move on. But from what you have seen, we are still testing a lot of people and it's possible that as more samples come in, we are going to record increased number of new cases. So I'm not too sure. I don't think that the population has already reached a peak. If you reach a peak, it means that the new cases you get will begin to go down. But the new cases we are getting will be more as we test more. Dr. Owusu says the rapid diagnostic test kit developed in Ghana could accelerate the testing regime. The RGT is one kit that, that will be good. Especially we should not expect that it will be 100%. The point is that no kit is 100% effective there will have to be a trade-off between the sensitivity and the specificity. And once you are able to reach some marginable specificity and sensitivity, you are good to go and to try it on the population to see how it is. So the RDT is, is going to augment or going to complement what we are doing. So, so if you just joined us, the breaking news that you are getting from the Ghana Health Services website is that Ghana's cases of the coronavirus has jumped up to about 4,012. That's from 3,091, just about some 24 hours ago, to this one. Now, that means that there's an, a 921 case jump. That's an additional 921 cases have been confirmed. That's the new figure you see right there. That's 4,021 cases. I beg your pardon, that 4,012 cases, as you see right there. Now, the uh, Volta region now has 32 cases. I'm going to go through the Greater Accra region now. Still accounts for a little over 83% of the total cases. The Greater Accra region, from this dashboard of the Ghana Health Service, has 3,436 cases. That's 3,000. 436 cases out of the 4,012. Ashanti region, 210. Um, that's from the 165 earlier. Eastern region has 96. Central region also now increased to 58. Western North region, 56. Western region, 35. Volta region, 32. Upper East region has 26 confirmed cases now. And uh, you also have the uh, Upper West region now have 20 cases. OT region, 24 cases. And the Northern region, 16 cases now it has been updated now it's always 13 but we did know about this 16 cases as at monday we did know that as at monday the northern region had recorded 16 cases but we're now getting the update on the uh, ghana health services website the northeast region had two cases bono region still has one case so now we have just savannah region i have a region and the bono east region yet to record any cases so 13 out of the 16 regions have recorded cases and that's what you see right there the new case count 4012 921 
additional cases. If you look at the hotspots map, it still looks pretty same. So this bracket, at least from what we're seeing in the Greater Accra region, uh, the Lankontinan area still has the biggest uh, cases, uh, that's confirmed cases. The chunk of the hotspot area, the big one you see right there, the yellow spot, is occupying that of Adenta, Baleshi, Lankontinan, Medina, those areas, uh, accounting for one of the big cases in the uh, Greater Accra region. Then followed by Mamobi, Burma Camp area yourself, John Kobri, Bawe. Ablekoma also and, and Pokwasi as well. This is how the hotspot map looks like um, from the Ghana Health Services uh, website. So that's the news just coming through. We have added some 921 cases to the case count. Now stands at 4,012. We're going to get some perspective to this and, and better still understand what this really means uh, when we talk about being at our peak, we'll talk about that. Stay with us here on News 360. But Chinese researchers say the new coronavirus can persist in men's semen even after they have begun to recover. Uh, the finding raises the possibility the virus could be sexually transmitted. A team at Shanghui uh, Municipal Hospital tested 38 male patients treated there at the height of the pandemic in China in January and February. About 16% of them had evidence of the coronavirus in their semen. The team reported in the journal JAMA Network Open. About a quarter of them were in acute stage of the infection and nearly 9% of them were recovering, the team reported. They quoted a saying they found that SARS-CoV-2 can be present in the semen of patients with COVID-19, and SARS-CoV-2 may still be detected in the semen of recovering patients. That's according to the Chinese People's Liberation Army General Hospital officials in Beijing, and colleagues wrote. Dr. Titus Boyo is a Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. He joins us via Skype. Let's get some perspective to this. Dr. Titus Boyo, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Now, this is the new case count. I want to start from there. 4,012, that's up by some 921 cases. How do you react to this? Um, good evening, um, and thank you for having me. I think um, it doesn't come to me as a surprise it only the bit that surprises me is the fact that um, some kind of announcement suggesting that we have reached our peak and then we continue to get this increase. Also, continuously surprising is the delays in the announcement. Uh, because if, uh, as of the time that the last press briefing was made, we were told that, that um, the backlog has been cleared and now we have 900 case jump. So, this is over what period? And I think that's a critical question we need to ask. And uh, the, the date that they say we had recorded our peak, how many cases did we get that day? Mm. And if you, have, if you have 900 over a period, I mean, the last report given to us, they said the data was as of the 4th of May. And today is the 8th of May. So this 900, what is the distribution on daily basis? True. Even assuming that we want to use the tally, the tally plot, which is what they have used to tell us that we are at our peak, which a lot of people in academia would dispute. Mm. Um, then, uh, even if you are using that, then they should disaggregate this figure to let us know how many came in a single day uh, of this 900 for us to be able to objectively also assess if indeed that figure they had as their highest daily record still stands in the light of this present statistics. But you know, Dr. Boyer, you raise a very critical point there because you see, if the Ghana Health Service is... is still defending the fact that we are at our peak. And, and you, academia, and as a matter of fact, even the researchers at the laboratories where the samples of testing is going on still dispute this claim, then where do we find ourselves, I mean, uh, as a country? And how can this, you know, sort of misunderstanding f help or impact on our fight against this virus? Honestly, we are, um, will I say, handicapped to, to make an objective assessment because we don't have the data. 
the person that has the data releases the data in a manner that makes it very difficult for anybody um, to be able to really interpret. And we can only make our statement based on what comes on their official website. If those are the research centers uh, where the testing centers are also having doubts about it, then that raises a very more serious question. For us at the Medical Association, because we don't have the daily records, it's very difficult. And so like anybody else, we will ask the question, if now over a period of four days or so, you have recorded 900 cases, what is the daily distribution of these cases? And we have been assured that backlog has been cleared. If that is it, is it our assumption that this 900 is not from any backlog? And if it's not from any backlog and it's from these four days, what is the daily distribution? Is it possible that in a particular day we recorded more than 300? And if we did, is that not more than the peak daily record that they've talked about? And in any case, um, what determines that a community is reaching its peak or a country is reaching its peak? Is there R value? The R naught, what is our starting point? And what is the present R value? And I think these are additional information that uh, those handling this thing have to bring out. And I see they, people have to appreciate it when people question these values. We are questioning these values not out of ill motive, but in the national supreme interest, and for all of us, our interest, just that everybody is at, at rest. We are at the handling end. And for me as a clinician, if I'm told that I am, we are at the peak and therefore things are beginning to look better, uh, rightfully they ask that we should not uh, lose our guard. We should still uh, be in high state of preparation or alertness. But if you, if you announce a peak and we are getting a jump of 900 over four or three days, we will need further information. And for us, the clinicians, we also need further details because what is the rate of infectivity now of this virus in the country? I think that is important for us. Would you be surprised, maybe very quickly, if on Sunday the president, you know, un I mean, what, what, let me find out, what do you expect from the president on Sunday? Because there are suspicions that there may be a relaxation of the restrictions on, on, on social gatherings. In the face of this evidence... I mean, would you expect otherwise? Well, like I said, I am seriously handicapped. And as, I can, as you can also understand, we've just been given a jump of 900. Is it really after the backlog? Is this still part of the backlog? What exactly is happening? I don't know. So, and, and if you have people objectively questioning this data and um, the people who advise the president or those who give the official information do not explain things satisfactorily to everybody's hearing, then it's, it's, it's very difficult for us. Let me put it that way. We are handicapped. So on that handicapped background, I would say that I don't know what type of information will be fed to the president. And I do not know what the detailed explanation of what our current state is. But I honestly would hope that if there is any planned relaxation of our current restrictions, especially the ban on mass gathering, it should be such that there is enough room for public education. Mm. I do not expect what has been happening in the past when a statement is made maybe on a Sunday and the Monday, 1 a.m., things have gone into effect without adequate uh, 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 education. We were all in this country when the ban on restricted movement in the two regions was lifted, and people went on the streets jubilating as though we have declared Ghana COVID-19 free. Now, what will the ban lift, uh, a, a, a lifting of the restriction on mass gathering be interpreted to mean? If we do not educate the public well, all our efforts at getting people to adhere with the social distancing protocols will be thrown into the gutters. Right. We will need adequate time if the president even intends to do any lifting of that ban. I do not hope that it should be immediately or it should be very soon. There should be adequate time and they should convince all of us, those of us in clinical practice, those in academia, those who are following the data, those in civil society, okay. that yes, right. the science really backs that decision.
I want to find out very quickly uh, the reaction to the res results we're getting from China that persons, men who are recovering from COVID-19, may have the virus in their semen. Maybe in a minute, if you could just comment on this development. All right. So uh, as a, a gynecologist, I'll say this falls well within my domain. And I would just say that it's an interesting finding, not surprising though, because another study has shown us that it's in stool. And even in people who have recovered, they can still find it in their stool up to a certain period. They can still shed it in stool for a longer period. It raises caution, but we cannot at this moment say that um, um, it's a sexually transmitted infection. It is highly probable that it may be, but we have to be able to prove that this virus in the semen can be active can replicate, and when it gets in contact with the sexual mucosa of a female or a male sexual consort, it can pass through that membrane and be able to infect the other person before we can say that it's sexually transmitted. But there is time for caution. I would want to thank you so much. Caution. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Extremely grateful. Dr. Titus Boyo is the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. So 4,012 as a case count, 18 deaths still, and then 323 recoveries. Aisha quite worrying that the number has gone as far as 4,012. But a number of military personnel were compelled to stop some women at the Nima market from selling earlier today after they refused to test for the novel coronavirus. The market's women insisted they needed time to prepare for the testing. Scenes at the Nima market earlier today showed some military personnel trying to convince women in the market to take the COVID-19 test. Although some of the sellers agreed for their samples to be taken, majority of them refused and even went as far as threatening health officials. That was why the military was called in to intervene. According to one of the security personnel who declined to speak on camera, the testing has been necessitated after some people who tested positive for the virus were picked up in the area some days ago. He explained that due to the disregard for social distancing protocols at Nima, it was imperative that the testing is done. One of the sellers at the market who also declined to speak on camera told TV3 she had done the test once and was told by health officials that if the test came back negative, she would not hear from them. She insists she won't take the test again out of fear of being quarantined and leaving her children behind. At the time the news team was leaving the scene, some of the military personnel had managed to convince some women at the Nima market to take the COVID-19 test. An Afghanistan's case statistics stands at 4,012 in the latest tallies released Today, by the Ghana Health Service, recoveries have reached 303 with 18 deaths. Should there be a lift on social gatherings in the coming week, which will pave way for schools to operate, will you allow your child to go to school? Our reporter, Joseph Armstrong, has been finding out. The Ghana Health Service have released two graphs to prove that Ghana has reached its peak in the COVID-19 infection curve. The president, Akufado, is likely to speak to the nation this weekend. Should he leave the ban on public gathering and pay way for schools to resume, would you allow your children to go to school? Let's find out. It's a no-go area. I wouldn't be ready to send my child to school because of uh, the information we are getting. And we think, I think personally that uh, the right measures have not yet been put in place. So I don't think I'll send my child to school, no. Now for my children to go to school, I don't think I'll advise it because I'm not very okay with the systems now. Our health is critical. Our health is paramount. No matter what uh, is happening in the system, if the system is supposed to run and run effectively, we need healthy populace to do that. So for now, I think that the ban on public gatherings should still be in force whilst they work around um, how to reduce the spread of the COVID-19. If I should go to school now, it will, be, it will be creating more problems. There will be a high possibility that I can get infected or not. Or not even me per se, only me per se, but anyone can get infected. But what are schools and churches also thinking? When we talk about schools, we are not talking only about private schools. We are talking about schools general. In general, looking at the public schools, they're looking at the private schools. If uh, we consider the class sizes of some public schools, then it will not be very advisable to reopen. 
as a minister, I will be happy if the president could, can come out to announce that, especially the churches, we can come back to do our normal services. It has been a quite long time. Uh, as you know, there have been a lot of arguments around market women or market places are operating. Uh, why can't the church also operate? We are not yet ready not ready in the sense that uh, we haven't put in place measures yet. Assuming the president should say now churches, there could be social gatherings, churches can meet, etc. Then in the light of that, immediately we, we as leadership will need to put in place measures that will ensure that we observe the necessary protocols. Well, we wait to see what happens in the coming days. Ten Togolese nationals who illegally entered Ghana have been repatriated. One of them tested positive to the coronavirus. Now, the Ghana Immigration Service in Afla repatriated them, handing them over to Togolese health and national security officials through the Aflao border on Friday. Here's a report by Komla Kluche. The 10 illegal immigrants entered Ghanaian territory on March 27, 2020 through an unapproved route in the Bono region. They were intercepted at the Duadaso police checkpoint. They were isolated upon arrest and tested thereafter. One tested positive with nine negative. After seven, their compulsory isolation, the Ghanaian security officials repatriated 10 of the Togolese nationals, a team led by one Lieutenant Mahinu Rock from the Commission for COVID-19 in Togo, received Mandanaku Kujo, whose putter tested positive. Mandanaku Kujo was transferred into another ambulance, parked at the Togo section of the flower border, whilst the other nine were driven on board the Bono Regional Coordinated Council bus into Hotel Ibis in Loma. The Immigration Service says it is bent but ensuring no illegal immigrant enters the country whilst the borders remain closed. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Aplau. Well, the Noguchi Memorial Research Institute is investigating the delays in the communication of COVID-19 results, and that's something that has really been of concern. The Institute, after clearing its backlog of samples, says it's its best placed to deliver results in 24 hours. Bonnie, a senior research fellow, says the institute has begun researching into other fields relevant to COVID-19. Noguchi's mandate is actually to do a biomedical, it's a biomedical research institute. It is not a testing center. Uh, so one of the mandates is to provide specialized testing to support the health service. And that's what we are doing. Specialized testing in the sense that the kind of testing we are doing, the public health labs may not have the equipment to do it. That's why they bring it here for us to do. So we are not meant to be a testing center, as it were. We are supposed to do research. So it will give us more time to concentrate on the research aspect of our work. This is a cold room of the Noguchi Memorial Institute. Initially, when the backlog hadn't been cleared for samples of COVID-19, you'd have seen them packed here on this floor. But because the backlog has been cleared, you can't see them anymore. They have all been taken up to the laboratory for processing to begin on these samples so that people who are looking forward to their test results can receive them in time. And so that is what it means when we say the backlog has been cleared. According to him, clearing of the backlog is expected to enable the institute to process COVID samples within 24 hours. We have cleared the samples, but it's not all the results that have been sent out there. Now when we come in, then we concentrate efforts in trying to do the part that is yet to be complete. That is making sure that the results that are yet to be sent out, everything goes out then that means we are done with what we So then we talk about 24-hour processing. So we come, because there are fewer samples, we come in in the morning, uh, research assistants will get in there, pick the samples that are there few, they will go through all the processes within 24 hours, and the results will be even given out within that 24-hour period. He added the institute has begun investigating the delays in the communication of COVID results. So now the efforts are being channeled to that area 
making sure that the results that are lagging some people have not received their results in a week even some people will call and they said two weeks but that one is kind of a something that we don't usually do so we try and investigate the results actually gets to the directors because these are brought in by the district or directorate so the results are given to the directors so we always encourage people to get to them to send their results to them we don't give individual results unless there are special cases that you or oh, you have contacted them they can't find the results and all that they will get back to us we we'll go into our data and we search whether truly we have worked on it and we'll give you the results the institute currently receives between 2,500 to 3,000 samples a day. Now, government has described comments by the minority in parliament on its efforts in the fight against the coronavirus as a deliberate attempt to downplay successes. Deputy Information Minister Pius Enam Hajide said government has been transparent in the disbursement of funds allocated for the fight. The minority in parliament accused government of giving false hope to Ghanaians about containing the coronavirus. Minority leader Haruna Idrisu, addressing the media in parliament, said government is not being forthright on the figures on infections while serving notice the minority will demand an audit of the funds allocated to the COVID-19 pandemic fight. The sharp rise in the number of cases reported by authorities in the last two weeks is deeply worrying and therefore the attempt to downplay this fact is unacceptable to us in the exercise of our oversight if you could lock down when the numbers were less than 300 and then when you have numbers up to 3000 you certainly must be in a dilemma but reacting to the issues raised by the minority, the deputy minister questioned the minority on its ability to offer pragmatic alternatives. President Akufuado addressed the nation and announced Ghana's preparedness way before Ghana recorded its initial cases. The claim, therefore, by the NDC that the government made no provision for the eventuality of an outbreak is just not unfortunate but also unfounded he outlined the interventions government is expanding in the fight against the covid 19 of president ekufuado monthly stipends for ghanaian students studying on government scholarships abroad have been paid up front and in advance the role of frontline health personnel in fighting covid 19 Government has provided insurance in the sum of 350,000 Ghana cities each for some 10,000 personnel. Responding to calls to get Ghanaians stranded outside the country to come home, the Deputy Minister said several scenarios are being considered. Proposals are being considered and decisions that are in the interest of the country as a whole will be taken. There are risks to all of the uh, options that are available and you have to balance uh, and be calculated in uh, taking those decisions. TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279. Stay with us here on News 360. Business News is up next with Anakia Mesa A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. It's time for business with me, Nana Ikia Mensah Brampine. Beginning with tonight, the European Union has blacklisted Ghana and three other African countries over money laundering concerns. Botswana, Mauritius and Zimbabwe were part of 12 countries placed on the EU's blacklist. The other countries blacklisted are the Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Panama, Cambodia, Mongolia and Myanmar, but the blacklisting will have to be approved by the European Parliament in order for it to come into force in October this year. The blacklisted countries were assessed based on systemic impact on the integrity of the EU financial system. 
The countries were also assessed after going through a review by the International Monetary Fund as international offshore financial centers and economic relevance and strong economic ties with the EU. Fraud and security analyst Richard Kumado has described this development as unfortunate. In the area of COVID-19, what they came up is that cybercrime has been on the increase and there has been misdirection of government funds across the whole globe. Once you have been blacklisted, there are so many benefits you cannot get. Your banks in Ghana cannot trade with their counterparts across the group. And every relationship you run even affects people who are applying for visa. To get out of the woods, the blacklisted countries would have to show more commitment towards tackling the problem. This commitment may be missing on Ghana's part. Many of the key players have left the industry. And so therefore, nothing is happening at all. And with the... With the Collapsing of the banks and with the convergence we have, we were thinking that some things could have been done. Training is of an issue. Stakeholder meetings is also of an issue. And the key players who really know what it's about have been relegated to the background. And many Last year, the European Commission cited six African countries, namely Ghana, Botswana, Libya, Tunisia, Ethiopia and Libya for encouraging money laundering and terrorism financing. In a response, Ghana said the European Commission's blacklist did not reflect the country's anti-money laundering regime. Ghana maintained at the time it was not given the opportunity to respond or implement corrective measures, which is the norm. What they need to do is to revise the compliance association platform. Let them get the boys on the field to do what is right and to get the things being done. Until the right things are done, these guys will come back again and they will blacklist it. They will blacklist we again because it means that we have become a red flag or a high risk dominant economy or a high risk country where people cannot trust we to do business here. The blacklisting, according to the European Commission, was to protect the EU's financial system and prevent money laundering and terrorist financing risks. Well, so definitely you know that this is the second time you're being blacklisted. And in subsequent bulletins, we'll try to get you some answers also from authorities on how they'll react to the concerns raised by the EU. Let's talk about the Ghana city's performance to the other major trading currencies. Well, the city has started depreciating despite a strong performance in the first three and a half months of this year. The city, as at May 6, had declined in value by 1.18% to trade at five Ghana cities, 60% to the US dollar on the interbank forex market and 2.36% to sell at five Ghana cities, 93 pesos on the interbank forex market. Currency analysts believe that the active support of the Bank of Ghana on a daily basis has somewhat helped slow down the depreciation process of the city despite the gradual rebound of the global economy after some countries eased their lockdown restrictions. For instance, in March, when the coronavirus pandemic had begun causing some stir globally, the local currency had appreciated against all the major trading currencies. All right, so let's still talk money, talking about that stimulus package after uh, the president announced it will be given to businesses. Well, president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association wants government to set up a committee involving executives of the business community in order to ensure a stimulus package of 600 million cities is evenly disbursed to members. According to Dr. Joseph Obeying, the intention is a good one, but the lack of collaboration with intended beneficiaries will only mar the efficiency of the package. George Quinney has more. The 600 million CD soft loan scheme pledged by government to cushion the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on small school businesses across Ghana is expected to start this month. The National Board for Small Scale Industries says it has come up with products to meet the needs of industries through stakeholder engagement while the criteria for selection is also ready. The portal for the application is currently undergoing testing after which it will be opened to applicants. Applauding the initiative, President of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, is asking government for more collaboration. Sharing 600 million 
with 200,000 people, then the average threshold comes to 3,000 Ghana cities, which is woefully inadequate, where it will not enable any trader, importer, or any of, of the sort to even um, assess this fund. So we want government to pinpoint where this fund is going. So if this one is capturing those people, then they have to uh, tell how much is also coming to the trading community itself. Dr. Joseph Obin revealed how expectant members are stressing the need for fair disbursement of funds. It's so overwhelming. Even new associations that are coming and all that, and the associations that are all over the country and all that, people need this fund. People need this fund. I, I, I don't know, the, the number that is coming, the inquiries that they are making per day and all that, it is it, so, uh, sometimes it, it gets to uh, even scary. <laughs>well, some customers of the electricity company of Ghana are yet to benefit from the relief on tariffs due to the outbreak of the COVID-19, while a number of customers have seen the benefits reflecting on their papers. It is yet to reflect on bills of others. Well, you can get more details of this in our subsequent bulletins. But, well, I understand that story is ready. Well, Adobia Ajua Owusu has been finding out from the authorities what could have led to the reason why some are seeing a reflection on their bill and others are not. Let's get the detail. The absorption of the entire electricity bill of a lifeline consumers, while residential and commercial consumers were to benefit from a 50% discount of their bills from April to June. The three-month electricity bill relief was to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on businesses and households. But the implementation, which started on May 1, has not been smooth for some who have not seen the relief reflect in their patches. I want to buy 50 cities and I didn't get any 50% or whatever. Others were also excited and reflected in their purchase as announced. In the month of March, I spent 160 Ghana cities on prepaid. And just this month, which is May, I went to the prepaid vendor and then paid 20 Ghana cities for prepaid. And after, after buying the prepaid, when I checked my receipt, I saw that I had a charge value of 100 Ghana cities. 21 pesos. First of May this year, we bought credit. We bought 130 cities worth of credit. So we we're supposed to get 130, but we had 188. So an additional 65.78 credit was added to what we bought. Some vendors who refused to speak on camera said they lodged a complaint with the electricity company of Ghana, but were yet to receive feedback. But the Accra East Public Relations Officer of the Electricity Company of Ghana, Isaac Enosin, has been giving some answers. We also realized that some of our customers didn't buy in April. So for such customers, they walk into the ACD vending point or the ACD stations in May and they didn't get the reliefs. Uh, we want to assure them that they should go the second time. Whatever is due to them will be given. He has also been reacting to unexplained deductions experienced by some customers. For instance, if a customer is supposed to receive 200 Ghana cities as a relief, the system would calculate the service charge for say two months or three months, looking at the absence of the customer at the vending point, and then take out that service charge from what the customer is due. Well, my 50% has already reflected. So if yours hasn't reflected, you can visit your nearest ECG office. You can get more news updates also on our website. It's 3news.com. I'm Nanikria Mensah Brampa. Enjoy your weekend. We have sports after this. Good evening. Hello, good evening, and it's time for the Sports here on News 360. My name is Thierry Nyan, and let's get down into the details now. Shortly after the dissolution of the technical teams, 
of the various national teams uh, here in Ghana. Uh, C.K. Akono was one of the new coaches that was uh, put in, in charge of the national teams. He had to handle the Black Stars. But shortly after his appointment, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, of course, uh, caused a big hit to affect a lot of the sports and activities, including the AFCON qualifiers. Now, C.K. Akono has been speaking to us exclusively, talking about how his work has been affected in the very first few days. Well, it's, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable um, because of what it demands. You know, um, I know a lot of people have doubts. You know, if we had played uh, two matches, I mean, I think uh, Sudan and then South Africa, by now there would have, there would have been a different uh, view of my appointment and also for myself as well. And so, but it's, this is a decision that everybody is facing and uh, there's nothing I can do about it. There's anybody can do about it. We just have to wait uh, and see when the opportunity can, can, can come again for us to, to work. I'm there to serve my country and, and, and that I do to, to the level, to the best knowledge of, uh, of what I can and um, see us you know, rise to the occasion that everybody will believe that we're doing something and there's sort of hope. I, I I know for a certain that the Germans are going to start soon. I believe that uh, England, the Premier League will also continue, and then um, uh, Italy. All right, so that was C.K. Akono speaking exclusively to TV3 Sports. There's more in that particular interview, and you'll be seeing that subsequently right here. Now, Ghana forward Kevin Prince Boateng says he's not done with the Black Stars and would fancy making a return to the Black Stars under a new coach C.K. Akono Boateng, who is currently on loan at Besiktas from AC uh, Fiorentina, um, has been out of the national team since 2014 after he was sacked from the Black Stars camp by then-coach Kwesiapia during the World Cup in Brazil. What is your or what is your guys' relationship to Ghana? Yeah, my my relationship is 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 okay. You know, it's like sometimes I talk uh, to someone from back home. I ask about the situation now because uh, because of the coronavirus. Uh, I even I even helped without being a guy. I helped. I just wanted to help. And um, that's that's it, you know. We, we with the national team and everything, it went went in the wrong way. I didn't like this, like I didn't like how it finished because uh, they gave me so much. But uh, but you never know. Maybe I can go back and play play one more time again. Yeah, or maybe you are assistant coach. Yeah, or I will be the coach. Who knows? Yeah, an interesting conversation there between two brothers, one playing for Germany, the other uh, played for Ghana. He's hoping for a return. And uh, he says maybe he could be in a capacity even as an assistant coach. Anyway, old Johnny Gallo hopes his loan deal at Manchester United is extended until the Premier League season is completed. The Nigeria striker, who is 30 years old, moved from Chinese side Shanghai, Shenghua, in January and has a contract until May 31. On that note, we bring an end to the sport here on... Uh Time for some entertainment news. I'm Anita Ikia Akufu. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic rages on and Ghanaian rapper Adam has reached out to health facilities who are in need of assistance in the whole municipality of the Volta region. <laughs> Sis Tefia ignited lots of controversy after the release of her song MTW on April 22nd. Even though Sis Tefia did not mention names, fans have concluded that she threw jabs at Sister Debbie, Wendy Shea and a Theodore in the song. The song has since seen counter jabs and reactions from Frida Rimes' KMT and Eno's rap goddess. Commenting on the ongoing beef, ISM disclosed that his favorite so far was Sis Tefia. My favorite so far is Sis Tefia. You know, for someone like us, uh, if you are being a singer um, and then rapping like that, you know, like I was really, really shocked. And then, trust me, the punchlines in there was amazing. And then, big ups to Sistifia. The Takradi based rapper does not have a problem with beefs, and he stressed that beefs are good for the music industry. It's really healthy to me, if you ask me. I think that it's healthy. It's normal, it's in the game, it's part of the game. You know, beefs are part of rap games in there. 
industry. So I think personally, um, I love I love what they are doing, and they should keep it up. If only it's going to last for a long time, you know, we are going to enjoy ourselves for a lot, very long time. So they should just keep bringing it on. So. <laughs> Oh, still in entertainment, Takari based rapper ISM is picking musician sister Fia over Eno and Frida Rhymes in the ongoing beef between the female artists. He says he's impressed with the punchlines delivered by sister Fia and such beefs are good for the industry. And I'm moving on to some other stories. The COVID-19 pandemic rages on and Ghanaian rapper Adam has reached out to health facilities who are in need of assistance in the whole municipality of the Volta region. From donating essential items to hospitals in Accra, Adam has shifted his attention to clinics in the whole municipality, requesting for thermometers, PPEs, hand sanitizers, and other essential items to help contain COVID-19. Facilities and communities including the Toko Kwe Chips Compound, Alale Family Health Clinic, Taviope Demi, and Fiave communities received supplies. The beneficiaries were presented with Veronica buckets, gallons of liquid soap, packs of tissue napkins and bags of snacks. The Efe4 composer is confident that gesture would complement government effort to contain COVID-19. Now let's find out what's trending in the world of entertainment on the foreign front. Former President Barack Obama announced Tuesday that he and former First Lady Michelle Obama would deliver several virtual commencement addresses in the coming weeks as high schools and universities across the nation are forced to hold their ceremonies online due to the coronavirus pandemic. He said even if ceremonies can't be done in person this year, himself and Michelle are excited to celebrate the nationwide class of 2020 and recognize this milestone with them. Taylor Swift has surprised a nurse on the front lines of the COVID-19 battle. The nurse thanked the music industry's biggest star for recognizing her and her hard work. Whitney Hilton took to social media to thank Taylor Swift for sending her a box of merchandise connected to her lover album and a handwritten letter in honor of Hilton's 30th birthday. That's it for entertainment. I'm Anita Ikiyoko. Have a good weekend. And as you can clearly see, or as you already know, the numbers are increasing. We're entreating you to stay safe wherever you find yourself. Just do not panic and spread calm, not fear. My name is Aisha Yakubu. Thanks for joining us throughout the week. It's been amazing. My name is Alfred Okonsei. Good evening.